This video is sponsored in part by Skillshare. You wouldn't know it today, but a mere two decades ago, Japanese RPGs were widely considered to be the defining genre of the video game medium. Series like Final Fantasy, Suikoden and Ys weren't just famous for selling millions of copies, though they certainly succeeded handsomely on that front and as a result helped to push millions of game consoles into the arms of voracious players. During this long forgotten mistrouded age of legends, that is, the mid to late 1990s, Japanese RPGs also set a new standard for storytelling in games. JRPGs, more than any other genre of the time, put both the act of exploration and the conveyance of narrative front and center for the player. It might be a sweeping tale of vengeful gods and the machinations of evil empires, or it might be a story of simple high adventure, a boy and his dog leaving the safety of home and striking out on their own. But no matter how epic their scope, these games had strikingly similar mechanical cores. A slow but steady power curve that sees the game world gradually unfold before you, alongside story beats that progress in pace with the player. The more you explore, the more powerful you become. The more powerful you become, the more you can explore. The Ouroboros of immersive narrative discovery. For the best titles of the genre, this yoking of the narrative to the player's growth creates a truly meaningful sense of progression that strengthens both elements. It makes for a powerful and self-reinforcing gameplay loop. As the player grows stronger and gains more abilities, they are likewise compelled to learn even more about the world around them and the characters who inhabit it. And there is one JRPG developer and publisher more than any other that define not only this formula, but also an entire era of ludic history. Squaresoft. From roughly the years 1996 through 2001, Squaresoft reigned as one of the absolute and nigh unquestioned sovereigns of the video game industry. They were one of the medium's defining institutions, beloved for their game's deep storytelling, endearing characters, simple yet deep mechanics, and a level of presentation that demonstrated for the first time how games could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with blockbuster cinema. During this period, Square released an absolute murderous row of RPG-defining releases. Chrono Cross, Final Fantasy VII, VIII, and IX, Parasite Eve 1 and 2, Front Mission 2 and 3, Xenogears, Vagrant Story, two beloved examples of which I've already covered in video essays in the past, by the way. More than any other developer or publisher, it was the output of Squaresoft during this era that defined our modern conception of the JRPG as its own unique genre, one distinct from the Western RPGs like Ultima or Fallout. But as Final Fantasy taught us, everything ends, and every mighty empire will eventually crumble into dust. Even as Square was at the height of their powers and financial clout, the company was suffering from no small amount of brain drain. Following their high-profile successes in the late 90s, much of their top talent began leaving the company to form their own studios and creative endeavors. In other words, well before the Square Enix merger of 2003 and the full-on corporatization of both firms, Square itself was already a greatly changed company from its beloved Super Nintendo and PlayStation 1 days. Amid this saga of the fall of Square, there was one below-the-radar-of-public-attention chapter that gave rise to a bizarre yet enduring evolution of the JRPG lineage. This is the tale of Sagnoth, a small independent studio founded by a veteran Square music composer Hiroki Kikuta in the wake of his exodus from Squaresoft. This creation story is also thanks in no small part to some angel investor funding from SNK, the creators of the Neo Geo and countless classic and beloved fighting games. What followed was the troubled birth cycle of an almost entirely forgotten gem by now. A strange and striking fusion of the horror and strategy RPG genres, the 1999 survival horror RPG Kudelka. It's a dark and mysterious journey, and a story that will eventually give rise to a bona fide cult classic horror RPG franchise.
All right, before we go on, I'd like to express my thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring the making of this video. So in return, let me show you what they've got to offer to you. Skillshare is an online learning community curated specifically for convenient and efficient learning, free of ads or other interruptions, with thousands of classes on topics like video editing, audio recording, graphic design, 3D modeling and animation, game development, writing, and a lot more. Let's say, as an example, you think of starting to record yourself doing talking head style YouTube video essay content. Own only a video capable SLR and have very little knowledge about the technicality, this is really the place to learn it all. You could start out with the classic fundamentals of DSLR photography by Justin Bridges to understand the proper use of your hardware, and then you take it into post and learn how to edit and properly color grade your footage with the free industry standard editing software DaVinci Resolve with the class DaVinci Resolve 15 Color Correction and Grading by Film VFX, and you've learned all you need to make your on-screen narration look better than most of what you'll already find on the platform. It's all there. Getting Skillshare Premium costs less than $10 if billed annually, and if you're curious, the first thousand people to follow the link in my description will get an instant free trial of Skillshare Premium without forced subscription or disclosure of any payment information. Go check it out. Thanks a lot again, and now I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. Hiroki Kikuta was burning with ambition. After joining Squaresoft in 1991 as an entry-level creator of basic battle and other world sound effects, he quickly rose through the ranks to become one of the company's chief sound and music designers. Square's musical head honcho, the legendary Final Fantasy composer Nobuo Uematsu, had made a point to structure the music and sound divisions as separate to and independent from the rest of the development team. This provided Kikuta with a tremendous amount of creative leeway, a kind of auteurist freedom when it came to his games' acoustic aesthetic. And Kikuta proved to be more than up to the task, heading up some truly masterful compositions for the niche Japan-only RPG Suikagi, as well as the tunes and tones of the beloved Seiken Densetsu series, or Secret and Trials of Mana as they're known in the West. This experience during Square's boom years of the mid to late 90s proved to be formative for Kikuta. And after getting a taste of artistic freedom and million selling success for his projects at Square, Kikuta resolved that he needed even more control over his future creative ambitions. And so, in 1997, he left the giant to found his own game company, Sacknoth. Kikuta became the company's president in 1998 and assumed the role of project lead for his first post-Squaresoft game, Kudelka. It was developed for the Sony PlayStation, a console that during the late 1990s and early 2000s became synonymous in Japan with JRPGs due to its highly lucrative exclusivity arrangements with Squaresoft. And for Kudelka, Kikuta's ambition burned brighter than ever before. He took on the roles of director, lead producer, lead writer, scenario planner, and lead composer. Eat your heart out, Hideo Kojima. In its planning stages, Kodelka was conceived to be radically different from the kinds of JRPGs Kikuta and his team had worked on at Squaresoft before. Their ambition was to create an entirely new spin on the nascent immersive sim genre. This might sound like a strange leap of faith for the team, but it really wasn't. The granddaddy of the immersive sim, Ultima Underworld, was itself already pretty popular in Japan, and the genre was seeing breakout success among PC gamers in the West, thanks to iconic series like Thief, System Shock, and Deus Ex. I'm not much into books. In preparation for this groundbreaking endeavor, Kikuta claimed that he read over 100 books on British history and also took Sacknoth's main design team on a trip to Wales, the dragon-bannered heart of Britain, to help them better immerse themselves into the game's historically grounded setting. Of course, the name Kudelka was actually borrowed from the famous French Czech photographer and doesn't really have anything to do with Wales or Welsh culture. According to Kikuta and the rest of the team, they just really like Josef Kudelka's photography and were fans of his work. A very JoJo's Bizarre Adventure-like flourish, to be sure. <laughs> All of this research and prep work was in service to some truly epic ambitions for the kind of game Kikuta and company wanted to make. A pulse-pounding experience that combined survival horror mechanics with an open-ended sandbox RPG format. 
Like the best immersive sims, the player would be able to approach puzzles from many different angles and use a cornucopia of skills to engineer multiple solutions, with all sorts of different ramifications for the game's narrative. But, as you might imagine, for a tiny first-time studio attempting a project of such a grand scope, things didn't quite go as planned. The team found that the open-ended creative freedom that had served Kikuda so well in Square's music division just didn't translate to a small and tight-knit team working across multiple artistic fronts in order to deliver a focused final package. And one main area of contention soon brought development of the game to a screeching halt. The rest of the team was not sold on the mechanics of Kikuta's vision of an immersive sim horror RPG. Dissent was rising among the rank-and-file designers at Sagnoff. Until eventually, tensions came to a head and the team flexed their collective muscle to overrule Kikuta, scrapping their work on the existing combat and exploration systems. Instead, they decided to make Kudelka a much more simple and straightforward game, with a traditional turn-based tactical battle system akin to that of 1997's Final Fantasy Tactics. Unfortunately, this headbutting tug of war would continue all throughout the game's development, right up until Kudelka was released in Japan in December 1999. There were similar internal struggles over not just the battle system, but also the overworld, the puzzles, and how closely the game would hew to JRPG conventions about player progression and the power curve. Nevertheless, it is often the most troubled creative inceptions that end up giving rise to the most fascinating and worthy passion projects in the end. And Kodelka is certainly no exception. If you're not looking too carefully at the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, it's very easy to lump Kudelka in with any of the number of Resident Evil also runs that were published during the survival horror craze of the late 90s. And from what scattered information is available about the development process, the game apparently was quite similar to Resident Evil or Silent Hill early on in development. That's to say, before the design team mutinied and they switched over to a turn-based strategic battle system. The game was originally planned to be played entirely from its third-person fixed-camera perspective, with combat, exploration and puzzle-solving all taking place within a similar framework against pre-rendered backgrounds. Battles would take place in real time, with full freedom of movement, and players would likewise be incentivized to make use of the destructible and interactive environment for both puzzles and combat. Of course, much of this ambition didn't come to pass in the version of the game that made it to shelves. Most of the design team wanted to retain the traditional JRPG leveling and battle mechanics they had honed during their time at Square, and so Kudelka became a very different experience from what was originally planned. As you progress through Kudelka, you'll navigate regal chambers and claustrophobic secret passages, collect hidden items and equipment, and solve basic inventory puzzles, similar to as how you would when stalking the hallways of Spencer Mansion or the foggy streets of Silent Hill. No tank controls, though. Movement in Kodelka is all screen relative. But combat is where things get really interesting, and where the promise of the JRPG meets survival horror hybrid truly comes to life. While navigating the Nemeton Monastery, you'll periodically be pulled into combat encounters similar to the random battles of, say, Shin Megami Tensei, for instance. But rather than the usual JRPG back-and-forth battles between opposing sides, combat in Kudelka sees you pulled into strategic combat sequences with your party confronting foes across a chessboard-like grid. It is very similar in practice, if a bit smaller in scope, to the aforementioned Final Fantasy Tactics, which no doubt greatly inspired Kudelka's own battle system. The player's characters can generally move much further and faster than the enemies you'll encounter, which means it greatly encourages you to make use of proper positioning and to exploit the party's members' strength to the fullest. The tanky Edward should be your frontline fighter, absorbing blows while the more fragile Kudelka hangs in the back row to sling spells and take pot shots. And rounding out the cast is Bishop James, the papal emissary who serves as the jack-of-all-trades party member. To battle the many foes of the game's voluminous bestiary, you'll employ a full arsenal of melee weapons, firearms and magical incantations. As you defeat enemies, your party gains experience and levels up, growing stronger and gaining access to new abilities and weapons. 
So far, so JRPG. The item menu in particular deserves a special tip of the hat here, because not only can you rename every item you pick up for easy sorting and identification, each item also includes its own flavor text description and hand-drawn illustration, which allows for some compelling environmental storytelling. That's right, Kodelka is the Dark Souls of... Upon leveling, you'll also have the option to allocate some bonus stat points where you see fit, in order to further enhance each character's skills and power. This is no doubt a vestigial remnant of the time when the game was intended to be a more open-ended immersive sim, but it does allow for a nice degree of additional customization for the thoughtful theory crafter. There is also a degree of randomization to the items and equipment you'll receive. There are no shops, or any money for that matter, in the Nemeton Monastery. Instead, the player must rely on randomly generated arms and armor dropped by enemies and found in the environment, all of which can have different stats and effects from playthrough to playthrough. For example, early on in the game, you'll find a knife lying right on the table in the monastery's kitchen. A knife will always be waiting here for you in each playthrough, but its enchantment and stats will be different from one game to the next. It could be a normal knife in one playthrough, a water knife in the next, and a mystic knife in the one after that. And there is one more wrinkle layered on top. Your weapons have all an invisible durability meter, and they'll break once it's depleted, which means you could be in the middle of a pitched battle against a difficult foe only to suddenly find yourself weaponless and scrambling. And like the best survival horror games, your inventory space is tightly limited, so you'll often have to make supremely consequential decisions over whether it's worth to keep trucking along with your powerful armament that is liable to break at any moment, or switch things up to a weaker but more durable weapon. Indeed, Kadelka is all the more remarkable for how well the mechanics and power progression of JRPGs complement the nature of the survival horror experience. Like the protagonists of Resident Evil, your party starts off as weak and embattled, forced to advance slowly and methodically as you familiarize yourself with your environs and surmount your many eldritch foes. Until finally, after hours of struggle, you emerge, powered up from this fiery crucible as an absolute name-taking and butt-kicking badass. The perfect survival horror pacing curve. But Kudelka is so much more than just another clone of Resident Evil or Silent Hill, or an attempt to cash in on a best-selling craze. The game also is its own kind of full-circle moment to that ancient forerunner of the survival horror genre, the cult classic horror JRPG Sweet Home, which debuted in the Famicom in Japan in 1989. And like Sweet Home, Kudelka is a much more grounded narrative experience than most JRPGs. Compared to the epic save the world and or kill god hijinks that constitutes the plot of most of its contemporaries, Kodelka feels positively varied for how much more realistic and down-to-earth its stakes are, both mechanically and narratively. The eponymous Kodelka I Ascend is a spirit medium who has a strange premonition about the rise of occult and demonic forces lurking somewhere in the heart of Britain. She's drawn to the Nemeton Monastery deep in the Welsh countryside, where she'll soon meet the game's party members, the roguish petty thief Edward Plunkett and the super-devout Vatican vanguard Bishop James O'Flaherty. It's senseless to tell you this, but the truth is... What the... As more of a personal character drama than an epic tale of sword and sorcery, the party interactions take center stage in this game. What can you possibly accomplish in your condition? You can't even hold your gun steady. Kadelka plays the hero nicely as your standard take on the late 90s wisecracking femme fatale action hero. And James and Edward offer a good bit of genuinely enjoyable background texture with their ceaseless bickering over matters of reason and faith. Will you shut up and get us out of here? How hard can it be for thieves like you to get us out of a place like this? Try saying that in the East End, holy man. Your severed head would hit the ground before you even finish the thought. Like many of the best RPG adventuring parties, these heroes are only allies of convenience, and they're as likely to bitterly disagree with each other as they are to unite in common cause against their foes. Kodelka in particular has a cutting and acerbic wit that is absolutely hilarious for how brusque and snarky it can be. If they have the power to do away with these evil spirits, I'd choose anyone. Even that dear old carpenter's son. Blasphemous! So <laughs> Pagan! How dare you utter such words of sin! This presentation is helped immensely by detailed and expressive character animations, fully motion captured cutscenes, and some surprisingly high quality of voice acting for its time. Especially when you consider its prime inspirations. No! Don't go! The 
The fully voice acted English language dialogue is, especially in the context of its time, an aspect that deserves high praise, with the main cast turning in solid, cringe-free and convincingly emotive performances. You're crazy if you believe this scoundrel. This killer's obviously executed hundreds of people. He needs to be turned into the police and judged in a proper forum. We're crazy. Why? Just because he's an immigrant? Or is it because he's one of the unsaved? That's bull and you know it, you pig-headed old bigot! What I'm trying I to say is- I believe this guy! Thieves can be exceedingly honest, you know? Still... He did try to kill us. But that... What did you do that for? It far surpasses the fare that players had grown accustomed to in the late 90s, especially when it comes to translated Japanese games. And it's a victory for God and all his glory, right? In keeping with the game's historically grounded setting, there is only English voiceover available, even in the Japanese version. Quite pleasant for the localization team, since after translating the on-screen text, the only further adaptation this game needed was to remove the Japanese subtitles of the original version. Charlotte, stop it. And also, don't let that quad disc package intimidate you. Kodelka is actually pretty compact, taking only about 15 hours for a playthrough. That's definitely on the shorter side for a JRPG, but a lengthier experience than the average survival horror title, landing it somewhere in the middle between the two. And the game's opulent presentation absolutely demands every single megabyte it can spare across all four of its CD-ROMs. All of these elements combined constitute a surprisingly strong narrative and gameplay experience, a classic case of the whole being much greater than the sum of its parts. I go, and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or hell. The troubled development cycle of Kodaka ultimately became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Upon release, the game was pretty thoroughly trashed by reviewers, who found the combination of turn-based JRPG battles and survival horror puzzling to be confusing and unappealing. The game was too different from your standard survival horror game to appeal to the action or horror game crowd, and too streamlined in its mechanics to appeal to the RPG grognards. It did not sell well, and as a result, Kikuta abruptly resigned from Sacknoth not long after the game's release. The team at Sacknoth would take one last stab at keeping the creative flame of Kodelka alive and licensed a manga adaptation of the title penned and illustrated by Dimension W creator Yuji Iwahara. And you know, it's actually pretty good and easily viewable online to this day. But the game itself is a much different story. There's no way to sugarcoat it. Kodelka is incredibly difficult to find and play through either retail or resale and cannot be played on modern hardware. You can't get it on any of the digital distribution services and it's never been available on the PlayStation Network for any of Sony's consoles. A used copy of the game at the time of release of this video will easily run you at least 150 US dollars for the discs alone, 200 dollars or more for copies that contain the jewel case and up to 4 to 500 dollars for sealed new copies. And so, as with many of the other retro and classic horror games I've covered on this channel, emulation is basically your best and only option if you want to play Kodaka these days. It's how you look at buccaneers that makes them bad or good. And I see us as members of a noble brotherhood. For the enterprising retronaut, JRPG fan, classic survival horror devotee or combinations thereof, Kodaka is more than worth your time and effort. Because while most reviewers were not fans of its ambitious attempt to push the envelope of the survival horror and JRPG genres, Kodelka was almost universally praised by many of the same critics for its art design, its characters, its music, and its attempt to tell a grounded and believable story. And from this seed, this artistic core, would eventually spring one of the most beloved cult classic RPG series ever made, a franchise of games that would proudly take up the torch for Kodelka's unique blend of survival horror and JRPG, and carry it into the next generation for an entirely new fandom. 
the major narrative themes and beats where Kudelka left off wouldn't be left unsolved for long. Because this game's dark tale of a god of death and the abyssal tome that can summon its unholy powers would find new unlife in a new series. A vast demonic world devouring conspiracy stretching from the quiet corners of rural Wales all the way to the hallowed halls of the Vatican. Yes, Kadaka was to become the heart of Shadow Hearts. But that is a tale for another day. As I've mentioned, Kudelka is a tough nut if you want to acquire a retail copy of it and not available on any digital distribution service, so if you want to play it and help preserve it, emulation is the way to go. As always, I've provided instructions on how to set it up in an emulator with the same settings I've used for this video, and the document also contains a paragraph about the legality of emulation and abandonware, in case you're worrying slash wondering about this. Now, since my video mostly covered development, history, game design, and the overall structure of Godelka without going too deep into the story and heavy spoiler territory, in case you're interested in a deeper excavation of Godelka's story and lore, a video where I also had the honor to lend my voice for one of the game's seminal journal entries, then please make sure to check out Jinzi's video on Godelka as well, which goes into exactly these things. You will find the link in the description. For those of you who've discovered me through this video, hey, I'm Ragnar, and on this channel I cover old games, horror games, indie games, or combinations thereof, and I try to bring attention to video games that have fallen into obscurity and indie games that I think deserve your attention. In today's credit bit, you're watching footage from Chasing Static, an upcoming 80s horror-inspired psychological thriller that, fitting to today's video, takes place in the untouched wilderness of rural Wales, where you'll uncover the mystery behind an abandoned facility and a strange phenomenon that caused time to stand still. If this looks as atmospheric and enticing to you as it was to me for the months I've been looking forward to this game, the demo is, at the time of release of this video, available for free for a limited time on Steam, and I'd highly encourage you to wishlist the game if you want to help the tiny creator studio out. Links are in the description. The work on these videos and the financial support of everyone who partakes in making them is in big parts crowdfunded. If you would like to help us shed light on more forgotten and overlooked titles in the future, why not consider dropping a buck or two over on my Patreon? It gets you access to high-quality Vimeo versions of my videos, one to several days early, as well as the chance to immortalize your name in the credit sequence here. Your help really does make all the difference, so thank you for considering. Today, my special credit shout-out goes out to these wonderful people. Billy Lott, David Zelenak, Dr. Haley Isabella Colley, Andrew Hines, Shannon Blue, Swallowtail Knights, Refkins, Isabella Stoner, Sterina Abramson, Hunter Crawford and Margaret Strawn, Federico Rocha, Casper Rahm, Boris Bugling, Jin Hansen, Kevin H. Yang, Kelly Michelle Russell, SSG Smith, Chris Chan, Cordelia Crescendo, Agustin Ortega, Puka Princess, Matt Gretton, Chris Z, Chuck Taylor, Pablo Arcelos, Laird Wakala, Thwagam, Raul Blanco, Quentin Podom, Alex Popov, Nobat Gerat Matinka, The Spiral Architect, Max Macula, Ronin Krom aka Daniel242172, Thor Haku, Faulty Gear, Lawrence E. Buben, Kerry George, Nineball9606, Catherine Escobar, Wang Vu, Ian Rhodes, Terry Collins, Lillian B, Dana Rosa, Giselle Almonte, Sophie Paulson, Kenan Ward, Christine Shkotsky Shkotsky, Ty McCandless, Lex Reckless, Corey Marr, and Nikon the Brave. Until next time, ta-ta. Anaira? -ta.